Okay, we're going to start off with some definitions. So a set of elements in an inner product space is orthogonal if each inner product is zero. Now also, if we have a set and the set is orthogonal and every vector, or we'll say every element, has unit length, the norm is one. It's called orthonormal. So we've got orthonormal if it's orthogonal and has unit length of one, and orthogonal if only the inner products are zero. Now here's the notation for that. Okay, so let's look at this and tell me what the conditions are for the, the inner product to be zero and one. So it's orthogonal if the inner product is zero. Okay, so if the inner product is zero, we get orthogonal. And which, which sets of them are orthogonal? They're going to be orthogonal if i and j do not equal to each other. So different, these two are orthogonal, these two are orthogonal, and so on and so on. So that's if i does not equal to j. Now, each individual one, u1, is unit length if we take the inner product of itself. So if i equals j, it's normal, unit length of 1. Now, another note I just want to make mention of, I don't think the book I use uses this notation, but I reserve u for my orthonormal set. If they give me a set with u's, I'll switch them around and call them b1, b2, my given bases. So here's an example. Yes, so they both have the unit length of 1, because that's the definition of i and j. And they're perpendicular, they're orthogonal, because their inner product, the dot product, is 0. So this is our orthonormal set. Now, just a note here. So this is an actual important note to remember. If we have a set, and it's an orthogonal set, all of these are perpendicular to each other, they're orthogonal to each other. If we want to make this set an orthonormal set, we need to just normalize each of them because they're already orthogonal. That would be orthonormal. So we do that just by... Like in physics, you divide each of them by the magnitude, and we get our orthonormal set. Now I'd like to start off by the projection theorem. Okay, so this is the projection theorem. So we have an orthonormal set is given. And it's a basis for my V, for my vector space, or my inner product space. Now, if we pick any vector in V, then V can be written... Now, this is actually just a linear combination, okay? This is a constant. The inner product is a constant. So that's my C1. This is my C2, and so forth, okay? So basically, this is C1, U1, plus C2, U2, plus C2... It's not C2... Cn, un. So obviously it's where ci is equal to vui. So that's what the projection theorem says. It can be written as a linear combination, but each constant, it can be found by finding the inner product of that vector and the bases. Pretty cool, huh? Now I'm going to prove this. It's a super simple proof. Um, so it won't take long. If I can prove that each constant is this inner product, then I'm done. So that's why I've chosen, I don't need to do it for 1 and 2 and n. I could say ci is the inner product of v ui. If I prove it for i being between 1 and n, I've proved it for all of them. So here's our proof. What do we have so far? We have v, little v, is in the inner space. And we have u1 is our orthonormal set. It's our bases, which are orthonormal. So v 
just being, this is just a regular basis, but it has special traits to it. But V can be written as a linear combination. That's just definition of vector space. So V can be written as C1, U1, plus C2, U2. So we'll keep that in mind. And now let's look at the inner product. So let's look at the inner product, V, U, I. So I'm obviously just choosing U, I. That's this part of what we need. And now the only thing I have in front of me that I can do is I can substitute this V with all of that. So let's do that. So instead of V, it's C1, U1. Well, remember that property? We can write this as a whole bunch of inner products, separating them by the pluses. The pluses are on the outside. And also those constants can come in the front of each inner product too. So that would be C1, U1, UI. Now, I'm not just going to copy those three. I'm going to add one more. There's one in the middle that's going to be the ith one, the random ith one. CI. And then we go to the end. This is what we're trying to figure out. What is this equal to? So remember our definition of orthonormal. If these are different, one and I, one's somewhere in the middle. If these are different and it's orthonormal, then that would be, the, the inner product would be zero. Yes. It's orthogonal. Since it's given to be orthonormal, right? It is an orthonormal species. And so this one's zero. This one's zero. But what happens, what's the inner product if they're the same? U I U I. Yeah, that means it's the length, the magnitude. So this is one. So all of this equals to, yeah, C I. Because C I times one. So what did I get? I think I proved it. This whole thing, the left side equals the right side. So therefore, I proved it. Now the question in front of us is how can we create an orthonormal basis? And that is, of course, if the basis isn't already orthogonal. So if it is orthogonal, all we do is divide each of the bases by the magnitude of each. So assuming they're not orthogonal, well, we're going to need the projection theorem. Let's look, look at that. The projection of V onto U. If you remember the formula, it's V dot U, or the inner product of, divided by the magnitude of U squared, and then times U. So this is a scalar, this is a scalar, and then that's my vector. Remember, our U that I'm using will be orthonormal. So it's equal to 1. So this goes away. And so we get, and we write this with using inner products. So he, next is our theorem. So next is our theorem, and this theorem actually has a name. And here we have it. Graham Schmidt basically says every basis can be converted to an orthonormal basis in an inner product space. And he is the one that we credit the process to. So the proof, or the process really, the process of it. So we're going to let our bases be one. And this is given. So given bases. And our goal is to convert it to orthonormal. So our first step is to convert this one to normal. To do that, pretty simple for the first step. Now I'm going to show two ways how to do step two, but moving forward and finding step three and step four, I will convert 
back to using the only the projection method way. So first let's, for two, for basically U2 is what I want to find. I want to project B2 onto U1. And let's draw that. So we do know these are parallel and we're basically projecting it's kind of like our shadow B2 onto U1. And it creates a perpendicular vector right here. So since this is U1 parallel to this projection, what we want is U2 to be perpendicular to that. So we can say this is some scalar of U2 because it's got to be perpendicular to U1. So it doesn't have unit length, not necessarily. A scalar times u2, I should say. Basically, u2 and u2 star are parallel to each other. All we'll have to do, once we find u2 star, all we'll have to do is normalize it like so, and then we have our second perpendicular normal ve vector in our bases. Looking at this, we have u2 star, because this is the resultant, so this plus this is, is my resultant. Whoops, sorry, that's not a b squared, it's b, b2. And what we want to do is solve for u2 star. Now, can we write this projection like we did up here? Certainly. So it would be the u on the outside and the inner product of both of them, times the inner product of both of them. So this would be u1 on the outside, the inner product of b2 u1. Okay, now we have a formula right here. I'm going to box that. And then clearly the last thing I would do, u2 would be u2 star divided by the magnitude. Just normalize it. So these are our formulas. And the alternate method to find the u2 is to use the projection theorem. So we want to write b2 as a linear combination of the bases. So B2, but we only want to do it for the first two. It is U2 that we're trying to solve for, so let's isolate U2. So as I mentioned, even though we do have a specific constant that we can find, well, we can't because we don't know what that is, um, it doesn't really matter. This is just a constant times U2, which means... If I just cross that off and put a star, then U2 star is parallel, just a scalar times U2, to the U2 that I want to create. And then I can just normalize it, like up there, like so. So we don't really need that in the front, and that's our formula. And as you notice, it's the same formula as we got with the previous picture. And I much prefer this method than drawing it because then I'm drawing into 3D when I'm trying to find U3. So for U3, the process is we take B3 and we write it using the projection theorem for the first three. And the one we're trying to find is U3. So again, we can just call this U3 star by ignoring that constant in front of there, just some parallel vector, and isolate this. So u3 star, we'll just be subtracting these. And we could keep going if we needed to, find u4 if we needed to, if we had four of them, and so forth. We'd be using four terms there, okay, and so on. So that's the process. So let's do an example. Again, it's very helpful if we go and label this as B1, B2, B3, okay? First step, normalize it. So we can actually use this notation or use this no notation. Um, I'll, I'll probably use this notation. You'll see why when we start using that in the formulas. And maybe we want to highlight that. And again, if you want, if you have it memorized, you could just write it. I 
tend to like mix up on my subscripts. So I actually like to write out the projection theorem because it keeps it straight in my head. So, and then I basically create that formula every single time. We're taking B2 and we're writing it as the linear combination of B2 in one. And this becomes my U2 star, isolate it. And my formula is, and then just plug and chug, okay? We have U1, we have B2. That's all we need for this. So this is personally what I like to do. I mean, if you just keep them all in here, you might be able to keep track of it a little bit better here and here. But I personally like to work with whole numbers, not fractions. So I will pull, remember we have a dot product, inner product. It doesn't matter. They are vectors, it is the dot product, but it's the inner product. If we have one scalar, we can pull it out. And look what happens when we pull it out. It becomes not no the radical will be gone, so that'll be minus one third times the inner product times the vector, and there's my inner product. So what is the inner product? It looks like it's two. Don't forget to bring that down. That's a common mistake. So again, this is my u two star. So you want to make your life a little easier. This is just parallel to what we want. Well, what's going to happen if I times this by 3? Look at star star. It doesn't matter. You can still call it u2 star. And I'll get 1 minus 2, 1. Still parallel because it's times constant. And then I can normalize this vector instead of the one with fractions. So much easier. So now normalize. And again, I'll just call that for easiness u2 star, even though it's a little bit different. So normalize it. Okay, last one. I'm going to write b3 using the projection theorem. Why I think it's easier to do this way. When, when it's orthonormal, u1, u2, u3 are orthonormal, could be written as a linear combination of u1, u2, u3, and it's just we copy, we copy, we copy, and b3 gets written in all three of them. Just easier for me to remember, but you can just memorize the formula straight up. Have good bookkeeping, because it's just plug and chug from here. We have B3. This gets to be a long problem. One, one, zero. These are my inner products, and I basically just pulled this out, pulled this out, that's it. Find the inner products. I'm just going across the first line. So we want to write one, two, three in terms of our new bases. So remember our formula to our projection theorem. And one more. So it is much easier to write u1, u2, u3, because I'm asking you to write 1, 2, 3 in terms of the new bases. So all we have to do is find these inner products. That's why I kept the radicals inside this time. They'll have a common denominator. Oh, that's 0, actually. Minus 3 plus 1, minus 2. And we're done with the question, but I wouldn't leave from here. I would want to check it. And to check it, you'd put in, plug in u1, u2, u3, and multiply it out.
And I made a mistake over here. It's one root one over root two minus three over root two is minus two over root two. So we'll fix that. Um, I knew I was making a mistake because I was going to get a radical here. And there's no way that I would be able to get my one, two, three. It didn't check out. So that's how I knew I made a mistake. So that's why you want to check. And look at that. I caught my mistake. That works. Okay, that's it for today. I'll have some more Gram-Schmidt using functions on the next video.